Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest uh, guest session series. And John, it's great to have you here. So to kick off, why don't you introduce yourself and the great work that you do? Thank you, Alan. Um, absolute pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm John, Chief Exec of Future Foundations. Um, we are about equipping young people to thrive, helping young people be leaders in their lives and in society. Um, in terms of kind of what kind of things that we do, um, we run three programmes currently, uh, one with uh, Unilever and Global Action Plan, it's the Personal Dirt is Good Schools programme, which is a values-based social action programme, so it's helping young people explore their values, um, and so today's conversation is particularly exciting to us, the other two programmes that we deliver uh, is one with um, AWS, so it's Get IT, encouraging more diversity and especially girls to consider a career in tech. And the third is Global Social Leaders, where we're helping to build a global movement of young socially conscious leaders and working with schools and partners around the world um, to, to develop a school membership courses that will help support and create a framework that helps them to take action on the global goals. So that's us. Well, John, you, you, you kind of just reel it off, but it must be so fulfilling working in this space because, I, you know, the, the young people of today are the leaders of tomorrow, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's definitely fulfilling. I wouldn't say it's not without challenge. Um, and it's definitely been a journey. Um, I've been involved in, in this sector and with Future Foundations over 15 years. So it's it's um i think the, the exciting thing is it all still feels new and different and um, the challenging thing is that the, the mountain still feels like it's just getting bigger um and what we're doing um needs more more work more innovation to, to because the problem of helping young people prepare for the future just seems to be um growing not not getting smaller <laughs> so i think we all need to do more um so that that's kind of where I'm increasingly at is how do we all work together to do more? Yeah, okay. So let's, uh, so here's the Values Jam card deck. And uh, what I'm going to do is invite you to help me choose a card for us to discuss. So, how many times would you like me to cut the deck? Uh, three. Three. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> all right. So that means I've got four piles in front of me. So, would you like pile one, two, three, or four? Uh, I'll go for four. Okay, so we've got two, four, six, eight, nine cards here. So a number between one and nine. Uh, we'll go for six. Oh, now this is one of my personal core values. So thank you for choosing that. No problem. <laughs> that ability. So uh, the first question, John, is this what does adaptability mean? And then as a follow up, what does it look like? feel and sound like? Okay, well, when I saw the value come up, I sort of changed it to pivot <laughs> as my word. And I suppose that's my word of the last few years is we, we've had to pivot what we do and how we do things. Um, so I suppose, what does, it, um, what does it look like? I suppose it's being willing to, to probably to listen um and then change course so i yeah. think that um um that sense that you know you're not you're not you know adaptability is not always is about realizing that sometimes just being on a fixed course and just going for it sometimes you've got to be willing to kind of go i'm going for it but i'm also willing to stop and just check that we're on the right course um what was the second uh look for Look, feel, sound like. So, the, yeah, those are the, the kind of metaphor versions of adaptability. I mean, in terms of feel, sometimes I think it's a combination of being, it, sometimes being adaptable can also be uh, uneasy. But then when you actually do then adapt or change, you then feel better <laughs> yeah. um, as a result. Because you almost sometimes are going down this direction, you're fixed on it. But sometimes if you adapt, you go through this sort of change and then you actually realize actually this path was better and so i sometimes say plan b is often better than plan a so 
when you're thinking of adaptability um having this sort of realization sometimes that that, that actually if the plan a doesn't work you, you come up with a plan b and then that feel better and strong and, and, and better and sounds i suppose uh, sort of builds on those similar things that you know um for me it sort of sounds like you know that, that it's, it's an openness just that, that there's an openness to change um and and doesn't feel awkward in terms of like we we have to do it because that's what we decided or that's what the plan was it's being open yeah i think there's a number of things that you've touched on there and you've used the word plan a number of times and i, I think sometimes we overestimate our ability to plan what's going to happen and exactly like you say you know you you can beat yourself up that things have changed and your plan you know is is no, we're not able to deliver our plan or even worse we are going to deliver our plan to, even in spite of what's happening around us but the the, the key is to be adaptable isn't it like you just said and it, it's to kind of not attach so much importance to the plan and maybe keep more importance attached to the intention and the plan can actually flex to suit the situation that unfolds because undoubtedly things will change. Um, and I like uh, the, the sound. For me, it's a combination actually of um, a kind of hubbub, you know, so things changing all the time, uh, but that hubbub turning into a kind of quite a pleasant whir, which is, it, uh, for me, it's about uh, the, the changes that are happening all the time, just becoming part of what is and okay, rather than interruptions and stuff like that. Um, and the final thing that's coming to mind is that ultimately we still retain a choice of what to do when things are changing around us and that being adaptable means that you are comfortable with that you know rather than feeling like you said it it it, it does sometimes bring feelings of discomfort but it doesn't have to because if we accept that change happens then it's just a question of understanding what the options now are and putting all of our energy into choosing the best one and getting on with it rather than you know being concerned and worried and i know that's a lot that's a lot easier to say than it is to actually do in practice hmm. and in in the space that you work in and just now we were talking about you know um, pitching for funding and stuff like this how relevant is the word adaptability to the work that you do? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's it, it, it's a, it's a constant in our experience of you know what's happening in different funding bids, um, adapting to how you know whether a project is working, whether we're recruiting enough young people, you have enough funding, and if any of those things aren't necessarily falling into place, then working out. What, what, what do you then do um, to, to adapt to the situation of where you are to, um, um, to enable you to move forward? And then I suppose the last few years, you know, we used to run a lot of residential programmes and then um, uh, COVID-19 came along and we weren't able to run residential programmes. So we had to then take global social leaders and deliver it uh, entirely online. And, train our staff and how to do that and, and adapt all the content all of our systems and processes um and then adapt our, our you know our business model accordingly as well i mean that that strikes me as a, a brilliant example so could could you share a little bit more about that you know if if you take yourself back to when covid arrived and like you've just said you're an organization that delivers face-to-face -face stuff and all of a sudden you're going ah <laughs> just just take us back and perhaps share 
a, a high level timeline of things that you did? Yeah, I mean, I, it was interesting because I think for me, sort of earlier, sort of in, I suppose it was in January when it started to happen and we were hearing sort of a bit of information. Um, one of our partners on our office, we've got a shared office space, um, runs a Chinese guardianship business and they were taking it much more seriously than anyone else. And I was watching that, observing that, talking to their directors. And one of their directors just said to me, the world has changed, John. It's, this, is, this will have an, an unprecedented impact. And other people that I was talking to <laughs> said to me, you know, John, don't panic. It's, it's going to be all over soon. <laughs> I'm not panicking. I think I'm just being realistic that we're not going to run residential programs this summer. We therefore need to look at our balance sheet and just draw a line there and assume now that, you know, worst case scenario, we're not, that's not going to happen. So what else are we going to do? And what, and let's prioritize our meetings now on what's the new things that are going to replace that because I don't want to spend my time having meetings about how we make that happen if if you know it's great if it does but almost i became and almost had to get my mind to the point where all alone almost i realized this is not going to happen and almost quietly got over that <laughs> and then by the time almost i think the world caught up and said oh some of these things aren't going to happen i was like right had already been developing ideas and plans and almost had sort of um got over the the upset and the disappointment <laughs> and then we've moved into that next phase of going right okay so if that's the case what yeah. do we then do um so going back going back to that time you've got this um benefit of insight of some sort from this other company that um had a perspective of what was unfolding or starting to unfold but then i'm guessing that most of the input that you're receiving from elsewhere was to the contrary. So what, what was it that kind of made you attach importance to this information compared to the information you were receiving more generally? Um, I, I suppose I started just listening and reading um, to try and find more information out to, to see, you know, um, uh, you know whether my sense of it was right or whether I was um you know reading too much into into that that situation at the time um and then I increasingly be, sort of felt actually this is something I think we need to to, to take more seriously and, and to spend more, much more time on the plans that that for, for not going ahead with the residential programs rather than the continuing down the line of of our original plan a yeah it's i think it's a, a really interesting example because when when we talk about adaptability sometimes i think people attach kind of meaning to the word which implies knee-jerk reaction and changing for the sake of it and those sort of things whereas the example that you've just given and what you've just said about um learning more, gaining information is a much more considered approach to adaptability, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I think I think adaptability, I mean, you, you, you've got to not be that you just jump from one thing to the other. And I think there's the other side, um, and it was something I was just thinking about as you, as you were talking earlier, is um, Seth Godin talks about the lizard brain. <laughs> And, and says about this concept of like, as a team, we need to have a consensus, a direction, and then we're gonna, we're gonna fly here. During that journey, we can't have lots of people saying, we need to change, we need to go here, this is the wrong destination. <laughs> cause that's no help because we're on the plane. Yeah. Um, but almost it's, I think it's that thing of sometimes you've got to jump with a leap of faith, agree a consensus and go there, but also be, checking the weather, seeing what's going on and, and, um, and then getting prepared for when you land to be thinking about where we're going to go next and gathering that information to go, actually, was this the right destination? Shall we 
where 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 do we want to go next and sort of pivot that next part of that journey yeah and then a, a, another uh, question for you because it what we're talking about here is adaptability in an organizational uh, context rather than an individual context and in many ways if you're adaptable as an individual it's reasonably straightforward because it's just you right you, you you make the choices and then you do what you decided to do but in your situation you've got a bunch of people that you need to be on the journey with you so how did you deal with gaining that collective um buy-in to what you sensed was needed um I think we sort of balanced the two of almost sort of continuing to go with some planning <laughs> in the direction of, okay, if this was to continue, we we also, I think, then surveyed our different um, schools to kind of see where they were at in terms of, of the offering. Um, and, and then we also then started to think through, okay, let's do the finances, let's work through what the impact will be so I suppose we, 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 we had everybody together by the fact that we weren't immediately just jumping into a decision. We were taking remedial action, which is sort of equal and balanced, so that we were then ready um, once we had enough information to go, actually, right, no, we continue, this will be okay, or no, actually, let's check things like contracts. <laughs> let's check that we're not over committing ourselves, that we're not paying a big deposit, that we can't get back. Let's yeah. Um, so we were sort of doing those right things openly and having that conversation. And then I think we put some regular meetings in to kind of plan um, and talk. Um, so I think, I think that, that again helped. We almost, I think, put in some, some specific extra meetings during that kind of uh, phase of, of, of adapting to this new challenge. And what, I'm, I'm reading between the lines here, but it strikes me that what you've described was um pretty transparent from the way you've described it with your people is that fair to say yeah no, I think so I think I think people were aware and, and, and across and then senior management were working you know sort of closely on it with an open conversation or back and forth and also a willingness to say where we both felt that you know was so reacting underreacting <laughs> um and 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 that that that, that balance being there and listening to each other as well. Yeah, and you've used the word balance a couple of times there, and I think balance and adaptability are really um, close friends, actually, because it's what you described in terms of understanding your options and then kind of moving forward, but in a way in which you can keep your balance by being adaptable and flexible rather than you know, this is the one choice and that's that's it and we're all in, uh, which would have been probably totally inappropriate. Um, okay, so let, let's take a, another question. And um, we've talked a lot about adaptability in a very positive sense. So let's just explore the other side of this coin. Uh, where have you noticed a lack of adaptability? Not necessarily in your context, just generally. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> you told me it'll be some tough questions. This is good. Um, okay, just um, just thinking of. I suppose the big one that's ongoing, and I think is 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 the two sides of probably of like the, the the Brexit debate. You've got those on the side that think it was a good idea, and those on the side that don't. And there's not, you know, almost. Um, there's a lack of understanding, I suppose, in the middle, and not necessarily always that that willingness to um, to. It's very hard then to understand each other and to adapt to the other's need, um, viewpoint. And I think that's caused over the last few years lots of challenges and issues um, in society because of the um, yeah both sides not necessarily being willing to adapt or to understand each other. I think it's a really good example. And if I can take that um, and broaden it more generally, it does seem that there is increasing polarisation into situations like this, whether it be 
an election, whether it be the Brexit decision, whether it be um, so electing a speaker in the US. Um, and like you say, it seems that the reason for this is that much of the time people seem to be more comfortable taking their stance and then kind of defending it to the nth degree rather than being willing to explore and understand the other person's perspective. Um, any thoughts about what what might be driving that, why that might be, rather than people being more willing to be open and explore? I mean, I, th I, th I think, you know, people, I suppose, having challenging times in terms of their own um, personal economics and um, can, can kind of probably have an, an impact where there's almost that protection feeling of, of yourself, your family, uh, your situation. So it, it sort of, I think that sometimes can lead to that sort of more in, in, entrenched <laughs> um, viewpoints um, wh where if, if you were more comfortable, <laughs> you had all the, the means um, that you needed then you might be more open to understand others and other people's situations. Um, um, whilst if you're in a situation where you're feeling, um, uh, you know, under pressure, under stress, mm -hmm. then harder. And I think it's that thing of, of that, um, that general sense of, of tough mental health, well-being, uh, stress, um, probably means that people um, are more withdrawing to themselves and to, their viewpoint versus maybe being able to open up and understand others situations. Mm. I haven't really thought about this um, before this conversation but what's coming through for me is whether there's something about the way that we are um, brought up and grow in society where you know there's a lot of focus on how you communicate your point of view. Mm and how you do that effectively and how you influence people. And it's all about you and your opinion. And I just wonder whether, whether we might be better served if there was more attention paid to us not attaching so much importance to our personal point of view, and instead equipping us better to explore and understand other people's point of view. Uh, and for us not to feel, there's something else about, do people feel a, a loss of pride or loss of face, you know, if their point of view proves not to be kind of the one that they end up settling on? There's, there's something about there being uh, that, that being perceived as a weakness. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, a bunch of thoughts come to mind. I mean, I, I, I think of like even, you know, my schooling where I think that, you know, we're all about confidence and presentation skills and being able to um, demonstrate what you've done. Uh, and I remember my first boss almost saying, you know, you know, got to remove the I, John, it's all about the we and, him saying, you know, when you write the agenda, you know, put, put yourself last. And, and it was like the opposite to how my schooling was. But it was a, it was a great sort of, I, I think, early observation in career, always, you know, these little things. <clears throat> um, and then I suppose in our work, a lot of what we're doing is trying to help young people um, learn to how about listening skills. So we yeah. do a lot of work on leadership, but we focus on social leadership and we start with you need to be able to lead yourself before you can lead others. Um, whilst a lot of people are, oh, I want to be the leader, I want to be at the front, whilst what we're trying to engender and develop is that ability to be able to, <clears throat> to be a good leader or even a great leader. You need to be able to first off be able to listen, to be able to see, to be able to understand others. So that's where I think you know, the focus in the education system is very much on the individual, individual performance rather than, you know, and then when you get into the real world, we're all interrelated and interaligned. And um, so having a shift towards more what you were saying around um, 
rather than the individual focus helping people learn the skills to be able to listen to other people's points of view um that would probably be quite it's, it's, a, it's a it's a little tweet but it's a big could have a massive change and um i had this experience of where i was doing um a presentation skills workshop and the presenter got us to present our own idea and our own project and then she said uh, you know um gave us feedback and then she said now you're going to go and pair up with someone you're going to present their project and their idea and everyone's presentations were much better <laughs> much more empathetic and they really got deep into the project and 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 i really enjoyed that like you know i i i was presenting this um lady's project where she had been painting um uh, refugees um and you know i was just caught up in the project presented it and i think it was one of the best presentations i'd ever done when i wasn't presenting about something that i cared about or did i was <laughs> take on this other person's project but um by almost removing yourself from it i think that has a certain power and, and, and i don't i don't know that people experience that enough yeah it's a great point and you it's i'm smiling listening to you because you talked about your first boss and now you've talked about this example and what we constantly hear from people in a values jam is how having the conversation kind of unearths memories that perhaps haven't crossed your mind for a long time um and a, a psychologist in new zealand explained that perhaps it's because values conversations are quite deep and it might be that they are uh, re-sparking previously lapsed neural pathways and that's what's causing you to to think back uh, to a time that perhaps you haven't thought about and you've done it for me because when uh, Lisa the co-founder of values jam and I were creating the concept we were playing with uh, the name and what we did was come up I think we came up with a couple of ideas each explained it to the other person and then we each proposed an argument on the other person's idea in in their favor rather than supporting our own idea and similar to what you've described it, it worked so well because i don't know there's a sense of you want to or we wanted to do the very best job for somebody else and that was a bit more motivating than if it was your own and there was also that i guess a little bit of two heads are better than one and yeah that's and that's how we came up with values jam actually uh okay so uh i'm conscious of time and i know that you uh have a a call that you need to get to so what i'm going to do is bring bring the values jam to uh, a close with a final question uh, which is this um what are you encouraged to do differently about adaptability as a result of our conversation? <clears throat> um, I suppose the bit that I was just taking away a little bit, just thinking about a bit more is, <clears throat> you know, we're trying to influence as with the education sector and how do we transform it? Um, just a reminder of that, 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 um, that concept of how do we engender that thing of that it's about um, <clears throat> not about moving from the individual to understanding and empathy for others um, so I suppose it was just it's almost a reminder I think of the importance of that being a you know potentially important focus um, uh, for, for people thinking about um, education and educate what, what, what successful education um, in terms of uh, you know I suppose it's a good reminder just of the importance of listening i think um and and being willing to to adapt so i think it's more about um what i'm taking away is almost sort of i think as you said it's almost taking you back to those previous points of where um you um feel um that uh, you, you've been able to see and understand and experience adaptability and the positive side of it. So I think it's just a reminder of some of those those points in the past that I think are good to kind of bring back to the to the front of how you're making decisions now. <laughs> um, 
and um, I think it's almost a good way to kind of like thinking about adaptability in this way is a good way to almost when you're under pressure sort of re remove that pressure from yourself <laughs> um, um, and, and not see that adaptability as um, I think you said that you know you can feel that sense of tension tension in the change because I remember that point you made that early on when you say well it doesn't have to be that tension there doesn't have to be that stress and I think it's a good reminder um, because I think at these times and especially over the next year you know economic situations we're going to face lots of times where we're going to need to make big decisions and make changes and be adaptable <laughs> uh, and those can be um stressful so it's almost how do you um manage your own stress um anxiety and think about how do you yourself be more adaptable um so that i think that would be a bit of sort of a, a takeaway for me is um trying to realize that adaptability doesn't need to have uh, that uh, that tension with it okay and then uh, i'm i'm curious about uh, what you mentioned about uh, the the work that you do and how to bake it into um the work that you do this thing around listening and understanding others and stuff like that now with um, the values jam sessions we really like there to be a concrete outcome um, no matter how small because that's the way that the session creates value right because if if we just have a, a great conversation and that's it then what was the point really so i'm just wondering in a kind of baby step away what what might be the first thing you do after today um towards what you've just described in and making sure that this is in there as far as the work that you do? Um, well, I think one might be that actually we play the, the values jam with my team. <laughs> um, okay. Because, um, you know, we, we, we are doing, you know, amazing programs with young people and, um, um, and we do, uh, you know, we celebrate the World Values Day and do assemblies on values. And we, um, we do as a team talk about our, organizational values but I, I i do like the the, the way we have really delved into a particular value and have that that conversation i think um having more of those kind of conversations with your team um and those closest to you i think it's it, it, you know helps you understand them more and and each other and then helps you then be able to work together to um to adapt <laughs> so i think that's probably a you know a, a very small takeaway will be i think um um we'll be you know maybe doing a similar conversation with 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 members of my team yeah i mean strangely enough on uh yeah on wednesday i'm doing a session with a client where uh so they've got a team of 15 so not a big team um so we're having a values jam conversation with the whole team about uh, collaboration because that's one of their core values and a real focus for them and that's going to last around about 45 minutes and then they're going to break up into pairs and they're going to have a values jam like this where they just choose a card at random and then uh, their approach is that they will then uh, invite their team members to have a values jam with a different member of the team. Um, they haven't decided how frequently yet, whether it's fortnightly or monthly or whatever, um, but they see this as a way to really help the team bond together, especially in this hybrid environment when we're less together in person. Um, mine mine i'm not sure what mine is you know because when when you were talking about adaptability and the the fact that you don't have to have the tension or the rest of it and it's about understanding the choices that you've got and then making decisions i was thinking about how sometimes <clears throat> excuse me sometimes when i'm in a, a kind of emergency situation <clears throat> i actually really enjoy it <laughs> and I, it sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? And I am very calm. Mm. And I just 
think about you know what what is what is happening what are the options and what do we need to do next and then get on and do it um but i don't know whether that's kind of we a, a bit strange because should you not you know, be more emotionally involved when an emergency situation is happening so i think mine is a bit of personal reflection around why that is the case and whether i need to do anything different or not you know it might be that it's a useful thing but i there's a little niggle in my head saying you know you, how can you be so detached and what's that all about so i'm gonna i don't know when i'm gonna think about that but that's that's what i'm gonna do so thank you for raising it so john that's uh, that's it you're a values jammer <laughs> thank you well thank you alan uh, it's really great to, to do it and to um, connect in this way and i look forward to the next conversation all right cheers john okay great have a wonderful day and week thank you